What is going on? You're listening to the best of the Visual Revolutionary Podcast, showcasing some of my favorite conversations. If you're listening on YouTube, go ahead and hit that thumbs up and subscribe button, please. I got lots of video content coming very soon, but I wanted to take a chance to get some of my favorite episodes of the podcast up on this platform as well. A lot of people were reaching out telling me I was missing an audience. So here we go. I'm giving it a shot. If you're tuning in for the first time, it's a show where I get a chance to sit down with some of my favorite photographers, filmmakers, and other visual artists and hear about the journey that shaped them into the person they are today and how they established their career. Make sure to check out the show at visualrevolutionary.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Follow on Instagram and Facebook at Visual Revolutionary. It's a good place to keep up with the show. Be on the lookout for a brand new episode really soon. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being fans of the show. I'll take you right to the episode. Revolution. Glennie Friedman, thank you very much for doing the show, man. I'm you know honored to have you. Yeah, no, my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. I, I've, I've heard your podcast prior to being on the show, and I really appreciated your discussion. Um, and it's, it seems like you interview some uh, quality individuals. So, uh, you know, it's cool. And, you, and anyone who cares about what they're doing, uh, I'm into helping out. Cool. I don't like people half-assing shit. I don't like people being slackers. I like people who have passion and intensity with what they do. I'm not into bullshitters. I'm not into small talk. Um, when people keep it real, I, you know, I, I'm happy to oblige. I like that. Uh, I want to jump right into it, man. Cause there's so much I want to talk to you about. Um, right. you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll banter along and then kind of jump back into the, into the history. But with you, if you don't mind, I'd like to just jump right into your past and talk about, you know, I know you've, you've told these stories a million times. And so, you know, I appreciate you doing it a million and one for me. Um, but for anybody that, you know, isn't familiar with you, where did you, it, I know you grew up in, in California and in, in kind of Santa Monica, West LA area there. Were you born in California or you, you were born somewhere else? I actually didn't grow up in Southern California for part of my life. I actually grew up on the East coast. Um, I, I moved to California in third grade. Um, my mom took me and my brother out there or second or third grade, I moved out to California. I'd say it was like 1970, 71. Uh-huh. And um, before that, I was in the, you know, the New York City area. I was in northern New Jersey, right across the bridge from, uh, from Manhattan. I was in Englewood, Sugar Hill, uh, you know, uh, Soul City, some people call it. Uh-huh. Um, and that is where I had some very formative years. I mean, my first seven, eight years of my life were that, well, actually, my first year, I was born in North Carolina. And my dad was in the army down there at Fort Bragg. And then, uh, but then after a year there, we came back up to, you know, where his family was living at the time. And uh, we were in northern New Jersey, right across from Manhattan. And, uh, and that's where I was until I moved out to California. Uh, when I moved out to California, right around that time, I think the first gift that I got when I moved out was a skateboard. A welcoming to California was was a yeah. you know a, was a super surfer with you know rock wheels mm-hmm. and uh, you know so we knew life was going to change pretty quickly. It was a pretty different experience even for an eight year old. You know all of a sudden you know you have nice weather all year round and skateboarding and and uh, but yeah so that was uh, so you know and from that and honestly I was a very bi coastal kid because my dad still lived here. So people you know a lot of people don't understand that I was so young when I took a lot of the photos and how did I get from but one, you know, it's in New York and LA and DC and all these places. It's my family was on both coasts. So that's how it happened. Right. Whenever I was, uh, you know, whenever school was out, depending on where I was living at the time, I was at the other family, you know, that I wasn't with during the school year. So mm-hmm. all, every Christmas and summer vacation for the most part, when I was living in, uh, California, I'd be here in New York with visiting my dad. And when I was, came back here to finish high school in 79, 80, uh, I would go out there for summer and for uh, Christmas vacations. What made your mom move to California? Did she have family there or was that just something she decided to do? Yeah, her family started to move out there. You know, they all started on the East Coast too, but she did have family there and she just liked it out there. She was just more her thing. And she's still there to this day. She just, 
she's just one of those people who likes California. I know a lot of people who do. I personally am, you know, not a big fan of sitting in a car all day to get things done. Uh, but uh, it wasn't that bad back then either. Right. But still, I just it's a different thing, you know. Uh, California. I mean, I think at the time we moved there, and at the time I did a lot of growing up there, it was a very, it was an important time for California. You know, California was it was becoming, you know, New York was you know, going bankrupt. They said at the time, you know, if you look at the, what was going on in the world and New York, it was a very difficult place. A lot of bad things were going on in the city and in the area. And California was really becoming the epicenter of all media and, and therefore would get attention, um, in different ways and becoming the center of the world in many ways, Mm -hmm. um, in the seventies for that brief period of time that it had the grasp and had the culture, uh, attention, it didn't have much of its own culture yet, but it had the culture's attention, right. uh, you know, after Haight-Ashbury and, uh, you know, and other things that were happening. You know, California was definitely coming up and uh, and again, becoming a media center after New York um, just during that period, I think, had a big effect on what was going on in our world. Um, I think that, uh, you know, and in my world, just as a kid, as a third through sixth, you know, through eighth grade or whatever, you know, I, when, the time I was there. Um, actually I was there until 10th grade. Um, you know, skateboarding started. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, skateboarding was there in the sixties. You know, a lot of people give me credit for being there at the birth of all these things. Uh, quite frankly, I wasn't there at the birth of skateboarding. I wasn't there at the birth of punk rock and I wasn't there at the birth of hip hop. Right. I was, uh, but I was there at very formative stages of those activities. I mean, skateboarding was here in the sixties. Punk rock started, you know, in late, you know, in 76, um, I wasn't at Ramon shows at CBGB, so I wasn't <laughs> sure. there at the beginning. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, I was a fucking young teenager, but, but I was there by 78, you mm-hmm. know, I had a cousin who was taking, took me to some gigs here in New York, who was a sound man who did sound for some of those bands early on. Um, you know, those bands that I was too young to see at the time. Um, and with hip hop, you know, I liked hip hop as soon as I heard it. And as, right before it blew up, I was there. I mean, I, I like to think that I was one of the people who helped bring it to the masses, you mm-hmm. know, um, helped people understand it and see that it was, you know, pretty much black kids version of punk rock. But, uh, you know, but then again, hip hop was such a different thing because it really was the most popular thing that I had ever dealt with. You right. know, um, I mean, in, in as far as it's uh, cultural significance and people accepting it all around the world. What, during the period while I was involved, sure. I mean, skateboarding got much more yeah, acceptable mm-hmm. over the years when I was involved with it. I mean, even the time of Skateboarder Magazine, it was pretty fucking big, but it was still kind of subculture. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly punk rock was the whole time I was involved with it. It never came above the surface. I mean, when I finally, when I produced an album, you know, for Suicidal Tendencies in 83, I mean, we did break the barrier a little bit there and got on MTV and stuff like that. But that was just a novelty for them. I'm not going to say we deserved it because we didn't. We just made a record and it was what it was. I mean, punk right. rock was way too progressive for, you know, the general population. And that's OK. I mean, not that we wanted it that way. I mean, mm-hmm. my, my goal was always to, you know, break the barriers, not to preach to the converted that doesn't make that doesn't do much you know Mm -hmm. um i took photographs because i wanted to share with people you know what i was seeing and i wanted to inspire them the way same way i was being inspired right and i went off on a tangent a little bit and we'll get into all those things a little bit more later so i'll let you ask your next question (laughs) tangents are great um i mean i think what i would say is that you know for me you were there at the birth of what skateboarding would become (laughs) You know, because it it just, it seemed like it went from, and I, you know, that's me talking out of class, obviously I I wasn't there and, and, but you know, it was this, that attitude that started forming and kind of more of that rebellious spirit of skateboarding and what would, what would start really leading into what more people would recognize as skateboarding today. It seemed like you were there to, to witness that. You know? Well, I mean, I was there when the Cadillac wheel was introduced. You exactly. know? I mean, I was there right when the when they went to a urethane wheel, and that really changed the whole sport mm-hmm. significantly. I mean, people were skating banks with stone wheels, you know, with the clay wheels and even with the metal wheels in the 60s. Um, but yeah, I was there when it really was about to get huge, and and I was there when it did, definitely. I was in the schoolyards with everyone skating. I actually went to those schools, mm-hmm. like the schoolyards that you see in all the movies, Paul Revere and Kenter and Bellagio. 
coincidentally, I actually went to those schools. Most of those guys came up from Venice or West LA or Mar Vista, um, you know, or wherever it was and came to skate those schools. Mm -hmm. I actually went to those schools. So I had a little inside track, even though I was younger than all them to being a local at those spots as you know, and that was my thing. Those actually never really surfed. I, I was part of beach culture, but that was not, and, and, and it was a part of my lifestyle, but I never was actually a surfer. I didn't, I think I felt like I was, uh, kind of, you know, behind a little bit cause I came from the East coast and I just felt a little bit out of place. Right. Um, I didn't have, I didn't have blonde hair. I had, uh, you know, natural, you know, an olive skin and curly dark hair. And, uh, you know, I didn't feel quite that secure to go into the ocean at, you know, five and six in the morning. And it was a very, you know, localized thing too. But I was a local at Kenter and I was a local at Revere. Those are my spots. So right. I felt very secure in that because I actually, again, you know, I went to school at those places. So, uh, you know, that, that was my thing. Where did the, you know, because I've, I've seen pictures of you at a, what appears to be a really early age holding the camera already. I know you were already getting published as an early teen, you know, where did the camera even enter your life and how did that start out? I mean, was that just something your, your mom gave you a camera or something and you started taking pictures or <laughs> it's, it's close. Um, I believe it was, a uh, Christmas when I was 10 years old, I got a Polaroid mm -hmm. and, um, we were on vacation and I got this Polaroid camera and we went to, uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, I told the story before, but we went to SeaWorld or something like, yeah, I think it was SeaWorld, politically incorrect place as it is now, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, and being the, uh, you know, animal activist, you know, hardcore vegan that I am, uh, you know, I wouldn't support those places anymore, but this was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, we'll give you a pass. You every, were a kid, every, you know, <laughs> That's right. but uh, I was at SeaWorld as a 10 year old enjoying the uh, orca the, the, you know, the whale jumping out of the water. And I had my Polaroid with me and I took a picture of the whale just touching, you know, he would completely jump out of the water, his entire body and touch this ball that was, you know, like 80 feet in the air or whatever it was, 60 feet in the air. The photograph I took with the Polaroid where his nose was just exactly touching the ball. So like the timing was perfect. The composition was perfect. Mm -hmm. And I just said like, wow, I'm good at this. You know, I got a picture of the whale completely out of the water and I was just 10. And so, you know, and I took a couple more pictures that, you know, holiday with the Polaroid. And, but, but I thought that I, there was something about it that made me feel good in getting, capturing that moment and capturing it the way in the most exhilarating way at the peak of its action. And so I think that was, uh, you know, that was, to answer your question, that's where that came from. I mean, sure. that's the first, kind that's of the, the first, first little seed, right? That was the introduction to it. You know, I mean, I think some years later, I think I was about 13 or 14. I took a photography class. I took a photography one at Paul Revere junior high and I had a pocket Instamatic, which for people who don't know, was like a plastic camera with a plastic lens made by Kodak mm -hmm. and a long line of Instamatics. Instamatics were a very, uh, how would you say it, um, utilitarian, uh, a way for Kodak to make money, but a way for Kodak to put cameras within the reach of everybody. Sure, your average consumer. Um, yeah, I mean, the camera, you know, was, you know, $10 or something. Um, even for back then, you know, um, it was pretty cheap. And, uh, you know, and you would have a flash cube that you could set on top of it, um, you know, and anyways, I just had a pocket camera. I took a photography one with a pocket camera, the 110 film. Um, in that class, um, you know, I was, it was pretty belligerent years. I think I was in seventh grade, seventh or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And I'm at Paul Revere Junior High School. To put yourself in the picture a little bit, if you've seen the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Yes, of you know, course. Sean, Sean Penn based that that character, he went to high school in a similar area that I did. Mm -hmm. And imagine the junior high school version of where he was. And everyone, I mean, not everyone, but like half the kids in my school, certainly half the kids that I knew at my school were all like that Jeff Spicoli character. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's what school was like back then. So I'm in photography one, you know, we, and I'm taking it with a pocket Instamatic. They allowed that. You know, you would think that you would have to have a 35 millimeter camera, and most people did. 
I didn't have one yet. So I used 110 film and I used a pocket Instamatic. My teacher wasn't harsh to me about that. He had no, you know, so I, I took photography one. But again, keeping in mind the Jeff Spicoli's in my circles, basically, you know, all the surfers and stuff. Um, I didn't follow the assignments too well. Mm-hmm. I didn't really care, but I listened. And I learned a lot about photography. I learned what the lenses did. I learned what the films did. I processed my own film. I made my own prints um, with the 110 Pocket Instamatic. In fact, two pictures that I keep published, I've had in Fuck You Heroes and I had in the My Rules book, were taken with that Pocket Instamatic. Unfortunately, I don't have the negatives, but I had some old prints and I was able to scan them Mm -hmm. uh, for that book. But So I took the class with Instamatic, but I didn't really follow the assignments that well because I was mostly decided to start, I was shooting pictures of my friends skateboarding and surfing. Right. And, um, you know, and, and that's what I tried to do. And that's what was interesting to me, but I did listen. Um, I ended up getting a D in photography one. Um, but it wasn't because I didn't learn anything. I actually probably, in fact, it looks like I probably learned more than anything. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Who else from that class? Um, <laughs> that's right. But, the truth is, is that, you know, six months later, after I graduated that class with a D, I shot my first published photograph. Wow. You know, um, I used a, I borrowed a camera. I think I got, a, I actually got a 35 millimeter camera uh, and then it was stolen. Or, you know, one of my brother's friends or something stole the camera out of my house. I don't know what happened. The uh-huh. camera got stolen or lost. And so I never actually got to use it maybe for more than a role. I don't remember what happened, but I wasn't really into it that much. It didn't make that big of a deal to me. But then one day I found this pool and I really wanted to try and take, I thought my abilities with the pocket and stomatic, I I had a lot of confidence and even people I would show my friends at the schoolyards, the photos. And, and, um, and so I found this pool one day back then finding a pool is like finding the first roller coaster ever with a loop. You yeah, know, it's just it's something very extreme and very incredible and very exciting. So I found this pool. Um, I was lucky enough to be the one to discover it. Heard chatter at school one day. Someone's house was getting renovated and there was a pool being emptied. And um, and I knew I really wanted to try and take some photos there and get some real photos. Mm-hmm. I'd already, believe it or not, taken pictures at the photo mat and sent them to manufacturers trying to say like, you know, pictures of Tony Alva, who was becoming well known. I said, you know, you you know, here's Tony Alva riding your product. You should use these in an advertisement. Right. You know, Um, and I'm like 14, 13 (laughs) sending these pictures out here. And I and and I have these little, you know, scribbled captions on the back, you know, um, speaking in the vernacular of the day. And I look back at them and it's so funny because here's a, you know, seventh grader with sloppy writing writing these things and sending them off and um but it just didn't cut it you know it's just they were instamatic photos they weren't that sharp and so when i found this pool i finally uh i asked someone if i could borrow their camera Mm -hmm. a friend of a friend a family friend of a friend you know was a very nice person in the neighborhood and always looked out for all the kids and didn't have any kids of his own and let me borrow his camera he trusted me and he mm-hmm. let me borrow and I asked what angle lens he had. I think he had a 35 millimeter lens or it might have been a 28 um, or even a 24, but probably 35. I don't remember right now. But um, and I said, Could I borrow? he let me borrow his camera and I went to this pool. I took Jay Adams and Paul Constantino there, two of the original Z boys, you know, were just guys that I knew, you know. Yeah. We, well, we didn't call them Z boys back then. They were just guys from the Zephyr team who weren't the Zephyr team wasn't around anymore. They had just broken up. Mm-hmm. Jay was just riding independent. He was riding a Logan board and, you know, and Bennett trucks and new version of Cadillac wheels. I don't even know if he had sponsors at the moment. Um, and Paul Constantino had just hooked up with a uh, GNS. And uh, I took them to the pool and I had the 35 millimeter camera and I shot one roll of color slide film, which I was told was what was needed for uh publication Mm -hmm. and it was the first time i ever shot color side film and i shot one roll of black and white film which i was used to doing from uh, photography one but i'd never done it with a 35 millimeter camera but photography one taught me the basics Mm -hmm. and what i tell every photographer that asks me 
including my mom, who wants to really get into photography at this late age, just read the instruction manual. <laughs> yeah. Master, seriously, master the use of the equipment. Okay? Because if you know how to do, how to use it, then it's all up to you and your eye. Once you know how to use your equipment, it's all up to your eye and you do what you want to do. Then then the then the equipment is not being, you know, yeah, you're not overwhelmed. Way, yeah, uh -huh. It's not in the way of your vision. So I learned what focus was. I learned what aperture meant. I also had a sense of composition. My mom was a designer and artist. And I, um, <clears throat> you know, I grew up reading National Geographic and Sports Illustrated. And for a few years, I was reading surfer magazines, too, at that time. Mm -hmm. And if you look back at those magazines in the 70s, I mean, there was a real sense of responsibility as a photographer to portray a story, you know, in a way to tell a story, you know. Um, photography was much more sophisticated of an art form back then. I mean, you know, editors wouldn't look at shitty photos. Yeah. Like they do now. You know, it just, <laughs> yeah. you know, a, uh, 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 you know, a, uh, 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 you know, a pop photographer of this day and age or of the last 20 years would have just been thrown in the garbage. You mm -hmm. know, it's just like, this is obviously not good. This is a sore to the eye. It's not sexy. It's garbage, you know? Um, and back then, yeah, I mean, there was a real sense of art and form. And so that's where I learned. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I finally got the 35 uh, millimeter camera and you know, shot one roll of color, one roll of black and white, the color sides. Um, they came out pretty damn good. And I was stoked. And stuff was focused like I'd never seen it before. And because um, of the pocket and somatic, you can't focus. Mm -hmm. It's just a fixed focus lens. Plastic one, in fact. And um, so um, I had these photos. And I remember showing them to a couple people at the banks, you know, at Kenter at the schoolyard where we all hang out on the weekends. And um, unbeknownst to me, I don't know if it was those slides or some prints earlier, but one of the guys that I met sitting on the banks was Craig Stesick. He was, to me, he was an older guy. Yeah. He was in his 20s. You know, again, I'm only 14 at the time. He was in his 20s. And he says, yeah, you know, you should, you know, you should send, you should hit up the magazine. You should send them down to the mag. You know, you get their address in the front of the, in the, in the front of the mag and you can, you know, and by the way, the mag was skateboarder magazine. Mm -hmm. Skateboarder magazine was the Bible before any other, as far as skateboarding. It originally published in the sixties, four quarterly issues, then fell off. Mm -hmm. It was put out by surfer publications and there were other skateboarding magazines coming up, but back then there was only one. And even when the other ones came up, no one really respected them. They were pretty shitty. Uh, they didn't have good photography. They had, uh, you know, they were just horrible, ugly publications. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but so this guy told me, yeah, you should, you know, try submitting him. And I'm like, really? Skateboarder? I mean, skateboarder was, again, I yeah, was the in Bible. a skateboarder. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had shown, then Stacy came over one day, Peralta, and I showed him the slides too. I said, I want him to come by and see these pictures. And he came by and looked at me. He's like, <laughs> you know, he, he used to call me Frito or Glenner. And, you know, just because I was a kid, you know, and he'd be like, you know, he was really impressed. He's like, these are really good. You should send these to the magazine. You should do this, too. Mm -hmm. And it gave me some confidence. Um, I called the magazine up, you know, their phone number was in the masthead. And I called and asked to speak to the editor. And um, I lowered my voice. Yeah, I was going to say, do they know how old yeah. you were? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely lowered my voice. And I said, oh, you know, I have these pictures of Jay Adams. And they're really great and they're really special to me. And um, by the way, you know, you know, there was no scanning back then. You couldn't scan your images. To get pictures published, you had to actually send people yeah, your send negatives your slides or and, prints mm -hmm. or your slides. You can't send dupes of slides because they're not as good. Mm -hmm. You can't send prints from slides because they're not as good. I had to send my actual slides, risking the loss of the images, which I could tell you later I, that did happen over the years, unfortunately, with some very crucial images of mine. But so I called up and they said, don't worry, we'll get them back to you if we use them or if we don't use them. 
we'll look out for these pictures that you're sending in and we'll let you know how it goes. And so I put all my photographs in an envelope with a piece of cardboard, sent through the regular mail, no Federal Express yet, sent them down there, you know, probably called a, a week later to make sure they got them. They said, chance to look at them yet. We'll get back to you. Don't worry about it. I'm obviously paranoid about my shit being lost. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, a couple of weeks later, a month later, I get a letter in the mail with the skateboarder magazine, uh, you know, writing on the, you know, stationery. And there's a tear sheet in the envelope, you know, with a check for 30 or $40. And I'm looking at the page and saying contest results and there's a couple pictures on the page and I don't see anything and then I flip over the other side which I thought was an advertisement and the other side is a fucking full page of my photo wow and um and my name is on it in the bottom right hand corner yeah I'm just like holy shit I mean I just melted yeah well, like, I, I couldn't believe it. Like the first time I submitted a photo to the magazine, I get a full page photo with a credit and it's a subscription ad for the magazine. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's not a, that's not your typical story on your first submission. I also felt this incredible responsibility that I have to do this shit because very few people are doing it. I mean, Craig Stesick's photographs really inspired me and I can't say that he didn't do incredible stuff because he did. Right. His photographs were incredible and very inspiring to me. But And I learned a lot from him. If there was ever a mentor, it'd be him. Sure. And it was just by looking at his work right. and, and, and picking up a few things here and there. He never showed me what to do physically. He didn't tell me. I didn't even know him back then. He was a mentor by default. Mm-hmm. No, I feel like you guys were both really kind of letting people in you know, it was, they weren't just skateboarding photos. You know, you really started kind of pulling back the curtain for kids growing up elsewhere in the country to see what was going on there and some of this attitude and some of this lifestyle and, and really, you know, let people kind of peer into these characters, you know, because that, you know, that's what's so much of skateboarding always has been and is today, you know, in the music scene. Well, I- it's just so many characters there and to, and to really portray that and, you know, give people kind of a sense of, you know, it's, it's not just the trick. Well, first of all, tricks are for kids. And that's what we always <laughs> said in Dogtown. Yeah. We didn't like tricks. It uh-huh. wasn't about doing tricks. It was about style. Right. And style is personal. You know, that's one thing that I don't like about skateboarding photography today. There's very little personality. It's based on the tricks, but there's no personality. There's very little character you know, if any, because you're shooting from far away with a long, tight lens trying to get a trick or with a fisheye all distorted and ridiculous. You know, when I used a fisheye lens, it wasn't a novelty. It was so you could see the environment the person is skateboarding in. Mm-hmm. And you could also be close to the action. End of fucking story. I'm here to fucking shoot the action that is inspiring me. Right. That's what's going down right now. And in within those photographs of action, character. Sure. Integri- integrity, mm-hmm. composition, personality, it, yeah, just, style. You know, and to me, that was really what it was all about. And it still is, frankly, when I shoot it, you know? Sure. So moving forward, I mean, you obviously, you know, as you were getting published, I assume, more and more in skateboarding, what, you know, what made you want to start shooting music? Well, you know, look at, I always loved, music was a big part of my life forever. Mm -hmm. As much as photography was, as much as skateboarding was. You know, as a teenager, quite frankly, music probably helped keep me alive with skateboarding. You know what I mean? You get, you know, you're a teenager, you're going through your things and you're, you know, you get upset, you get depressed or whatever it is that happens to you in life. And music helps you get out of that shell, right? Right. Um, You know, when we were kids, you know, music was a very big part of the scene. Um, you know, in skateboarding, uh, you know, we'd be listening to Led Zeppelin and, you know, the God forsaken now Ted Nugent, who was incredible back then. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. It turned out to be a horrible human being (laughs) later on. Um, you know, but, but his music had more energy Mm -hmm. and was faster than anyone's, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, early Aerosmith, 
you know, this stuff was inspirational. But before that, the Beatles, you know, right. um, you know, uh, and, and and lots of great music, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder, you know, uh, uh, Isaac Hayes, you know, there's lots of different things going on that I remember listening to as a kid and, um, you know, and the Stones and whatnot. But but in the heavy metal, the, the early days of heavy metal, that stuff was everything to us. And that was a very, very big part of the skating lifestyle. Um, by 1978, not so much in 77, but by 78, some of us were getting, uh, tapes from friends or being invited to independent rock shows, Mm -hmm. right? In clubs, you know, we had gone to big concerts and stuff, but as young kids, not, we didn't really have the opportunity to go into nightclubs, right? Right. So all of a sudden, and we start hearing this new music. You have to understand, punk rock was new. There was no such thing. When I was 14, there was no such thing as punk rock. Sure. Didn't exist. There were bands, though, like the Stooges and the Sonics and many other punk bands, I mean, garage-type, you know, hard bands mm-hmm. that had that spirit of punk, but it wasn't called that yet. And and I, quite honestly, I wasn't cool enough to know about that stuff. Right. You know, and most people who listen to it now didn't know about it then. <laughs> sure. It was very, very underground, and we just, you know, weren't that cool. But once I was exposed to the Sex Pistols and the Ramones, more importantly, the Ramones first, because mm-hmm. the Ramones are very poppy, and I loved the Ramones the minute I heard it. I thought the Ramones were fucking amazing. I just loved it. The Sex Pistols, when I first heard it, was, was I mean, I'm talking just for the first couple weeks. It took me a while to warm up to the Sex Pistols because it was just so gnarly. Mm-hmm. The screaming was just so aggressive and so gnarly. I just, you know, but you listen to it now, it's like a great rock record. It's not even a punk record. But I mean, it's punk in its attitude, but the music is just, you know, really straightforward. But, um, but that music was like the next level in energy and excitement, you know, for us as skateboarders. And so it became a big part of our thing. And then we started going to shows. All of a sudden, you're at a show where you're not at fucking Madison Square Garden or the Forum. You're at a fucking, at the Whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, or at CBGB's or, you know, at at some other small venue. And you're seeing a band play within arm's reach. Right. And it's like the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. It's like... It's like inspiring you and kicking your ass inside out like it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's changing your life. Um, and once again, I'm involved in this and I'm like, I don't see any good pictures of this right around. And not only that is like, I'm going to try spreading this into skateboarding magazines and so I start shooting pictures of my friends' bands, of mm-hmm. other bands. And at this point, I had already been published, sure. you know, for a couple of years, four or five years. So here I am, like, you know, 18 years old. I'm at shows, and I'm taking pictures. And frankly, I'm taking pictures better than anyone's seen of bands. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got, I, I've cut my teeth in skateboarding. So when it comes to live photos... I'm capturing those exact most intense moments more accurately than anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and they look good. And for some of the musicians who had no idea, who never, who I never met before, they see this stuff and they're like, wow, really? They're just like, you know, never seen pictures of ourselves like this. Uh-huh. And for a lot of other people um, that I happen to meet, they're like, holy shit, Glennie Friedman from Skateboarder Magazine is taking our picture All of right, our band. sure, yeah. And, you know, and the respect went both ways, though. Because, you know, frankly, I never took pictures of people that I didn't respect mm-hmm. for the most part. I mean, I've done it, but this, my best work and my best, you know, when I'm inspired to shoot pictures, I mean, is this... It's because I respect what they're doing. Right. And that's what gets me to kicks my ass. And it's my personal sense of responsibility. Pictures of them. Right. Um, even if it's entertainment, if like if they're entertaining me and it's not just like the political aspect of it, you know, uh, I want to do these guys justice. Mm-hmm. Really? You know, and all my life, it's like all you want to do is your subjects justice. Right. Sometimes that means going overboard and making them something that they're not just because 
you want people to respect them as much as you do. Sure. You know, not every artist looks as cool in real life as they do in our pho- photographs. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> but but I see them in a particular way and I want to work with them and make them as cool as I think they should be seen. Um, and, you know, with the music stuff, um, you know, having the outlet of Skateboarder magazine mm-hmm. was one bit of help. You know, skateboarder was beginning. Skateboarding had a, a down period in the late seventies. All of a sudden, after this big, huge boom, the peak era, the peak magazine, actually, the peak issue of skateboarder magazine was July nineteen seventy eight. Hmm. At that time, it was the most popular magazine in America outside of pornography. Really, I didn't know that. Being so, I'm sorry, the most popular magazine. For the Southland Corporation, which is Seven okay. Elevens, sure, okay, being sold in, you know, Seven Elevens. Which, by the way, at the time, Seven Eleven was the main, you know, mini mart type place in the country. Mm-hmm. You didn't have these, you know. Now they're everywhere, and there's hundreds of different, you know, places where people could buy shit. But Seven Eleven was a very big deal back then, and it was their number one selling magazine outside of pornography. <laughs> um, and they were had over a million readers at that time. Wow. Um, but after that, it started to go down mm-hmm. um, because of skateboarding. There's a lot of reasons to explain why skateboarding went down. This is not a skateboarding podcast, so I'm not going to get into that. Sure. But at that time, this, the magazine started diversifying and they want to start putting record reviews in, try and raise revenue through advertising music or whatever. And they started putting different sports in the magazine, extreme stuff. They were kind of ahead of the curve, but they did it in a really shitty way and eventually went out of business. But I was able to get some music reviews in there and some music photos in the skateboarding magazines. Um, I shot pictures of Black Flag and I talked about Black Flag and had it mentioned in Skateboarder and Skateboarder's Action Now, which helped, you know, spread that word through that community Mm -hmm. like nothing else in American punk rock had had before because everything else is very underground and Skateboarder was not, it was pretty mainstream at that time or, you know, relatively mainstream to, uh, you know, certainly very mainstream compared to punk rock fanzines which sure. were printing in the hundreds or in the thousands of copies but mm-hmm. not more than a 1500 or you know 2000 at the most at the mm-hmm. time um so yeah i started shooting all those photos and the music stuff i mean i was inspired by it and i was just loving it and it was uh you know skateboarding was beginning to uh wane a little bit you know everyone was in skate parks now it wasn't exciting with the backyard pools as much and People like backyard pools, and in fact, anyone would take a backyard pool over a skate park almost any day, any hardcore skateboarder. But uh, it was just, you know, it wasn't as exciting for me. You know, all the people were wearing all the safety equipment that takes away part of the personality of the skater. Mm -hmm. Uh, People were in skate parks. It was kind of sterile. You had all these, you know, light posts in the background of your images. And, and, you know, it just started getting ugly, Mm -hmm. to be honest, in some ways. And I was just growing up. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, music was becoming more part of my life and I was becoming even more politicized than I was um, by the music and learning stuff. And so I really thought that it was crucial, um, a very crucial time politically to get very involved in the music and help try and, you know, spread that seed. You know, I mean, when I was involved in skateboarding, I really thought that it was like a savior for me. Mm-hmm. And skateboarding was this revolutionary art form activity that I wanted everyone in the world to know about. Sure. I didn't just do it to, again, like I said earlier, to preach the converted. I wanted people to see it as exciting and as exhilarating and as personal and as gratifying Mm -hmm. um, as it was for me. I wanted other people to understand that. I didn't just shoot for skateboarder, by the way. That that was who I was working for at the time. I was doing it for myself, number one. Mm -hmm. The magazine was an outlet. I did give some ads to some manufacturers, but I submitted photographs to Sports Illustrated. Mm -hmm. I was like, you guys got to cover this. (laughs) Yeah. This is something incredible. Uh Uh-huh. And I would just get my pictures back. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure. With with form letters, you know. Right. Um. You know, and but I tried because I wanted to spread it. You know, I wanted people to, and I was just too soon. You uh-huh. know, they just didn't get it yet. They could have been ahead of the curve. And the same thing with punk rock, you know, Black Flag and all those, you know, Minor Threat, Bad Brains. I sent pictures of those bands to Rolling Stone, to Cream Magazine, 
And then when black, and of course it all came back, no interest whatsoever. Mm -hmm. People might not believe that now, but that's how the pictures you see in my books, I sent to fucking magazines and got rejected. Uh The pictures that stand as iconic images today, rejected. Mm -hmm. They were great photographs. And that's the thing that pisses me off. It doesn't even matter whether they like the band or not, but those magazines were about exposing music to, you know, on a commercial scale. Mm -hmm. Um, When Black Flag got their record uh, banned from major distribution and the MCA, the distribution company, called it an anti-parent record and put one of the first stickers ever on a record. Yeah. Before parental advisory stickers. Mm Mm-hmm. It was one of the first stickers ever put on a record um, saying that this is an anti-parent record. I submitted photographs at that time. That's newsworthy. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that had ever happened before. And I submitted pictures of Black Flag to Time, Newsweek, Los Angeles Times, New York Times. I just, you know, I remember being on the floor of my bedroom um, and, you know, all these envelopes laid out with all the addresses on them. I had bought a copy of each of the magazines because you couldn't look it up on the Internet. You had to buy a copy of the magazine or go to the newsstand mm-hmm. and write down the addresses and the photo editor's names or the editor's names that you thought might be interested in such a thing. And I probably had a dozen envelopes on the floor, you know, and I learned a lot of that from Black Flag, too, how to, you know, get into the press and do that press stuff. Mm-hmm. And I put eight by tens, you know, a couple in each envelope with, uh, you know my own personal press release that I would write about why this is important and what's going on. And all that shit came back. And this is all, so this is all happening as a high school kid, basically the, I think the the early black black flag, flag, minor threat stuff. No, the black flag, minor threat stuff. I'm in college by that point. Okay. I'm in my first, I'm in my first and second year in college and third year in college, early college years. Um, I never took time off. So I went right from high school to college. So this is 1980. Okay. Um, to 83. But I, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but all that stuff got sent back, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and that's just how it goes. You said you went back to New York and in high school, and then obviously you came back to California to go to college. When you went to college, I mean, you know, by that point, you know, you're quote unquote professional photographer for since you were a kid, <laughs> you know, were you, were you going to college with the idea that, Hey, I could keep, I mean, I can continue to be a photographer and this is, this could this could really become a job or did you ever even look at it that way? I mean, was it just something where you're like, this is what I do because I do it. And I'm just curious, you know, because I mean, at at that age, you know, so many people, I mean, once again, to have that kind of passion at 14, you know, how does that translate into your, you know, when you're 20 and you're in college, is it so ingrained then that you know what you want to do or were you, were you still just like, I'm not really even sure what it is I'm going to (laughs) do. I didn't give a shit. Yeah, I, was just, that's right. I was just doing what I did. Uh-huh. And I was going to college just like any other kid. I didn't have any idea that I would be a photographer. Huh. I was just, I was already published for those years, but that's just something that I did. Right. You know, um, I, I was interested in it. I loved it. I had mastered it to some degree, mm-hmm. but I also didn't, as much as I knew what I was doing was great. I didn't get a lot of respect for it, but I would just always do it. So, you know, it didn't really... I was in college not knowing what I was going to do, but, um, but honestly, you know, my second year in college, I went to a junior college to get up my GPA Uh and it was at Santa Monica college, which is my local area that I went to, you know, junior high school and started high school. And, and I took photography one just to get my GPA up, you know, Uh and I, and, and, you know, and one person recognized me in the class there was a skater in the class, you know, a surfer, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and said, what the fuck are you doing in here? Um, but I was like, I just got to get my GPA up, man. I want to yeah. go to UCLA. And so, and I did. I ended up getting an A in the class, you know, just doing his silly assignments and just taking it, taking one, you know, on the chin, just like, you know, just be in photography one. Let's hear what this fuck has to teach me and see. How, and it was so amazing to see how someone would teach photography to students. It was just like, it was really disappointing and interesting and, you know, but, but, you know, I, I got the A in the class and most kids came up to me after the end of class to ask questions rather than the teacher. And I didn't try embarrassing the teacher, but, you know, they could see, and they didn't know I wasn't well known or anything, you know, just, sure. you know, I just, but in the, within the class discussions, they could see that I had a different perspective and I might've brought up that I was already published and the teacher just like, you know, you know, uh, you know, furl his eyebrows at me or whatever. <laughs> yeah, know, great. <laughs> you know, and, um, but, uh. 
you know, but yeah, in college, I actually thought that I would eventually get into filmmaking. Mm-hmm. That's what I thought I was going to get into. Okay. And I finally, and I did get into UCLA finally, and I did get on the honor roll that year get after taking photography one, uh, just to get my GPA up. And I'd never been on the honor roll in my life, by the way. Um, but, uh, but so that was cool. And I got into UCLA, but I found, uh, UCLA very, uh, it was very competitive, very disappointing and how people weren't there to support each other, the learning process. I learned a lot of great stuff there, but it was just too competitive and they graded on a curve a lot. And, uh, you know, and I took communications and frankly, it's like, by the time I was, I tried to get into communication major to further my, uh, you know, progression into maybe being into filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and they wouldn't let me in because my GPA wasn't high enough. And I'm like, I showed them my portfolio of printed work in skateboard magazines. And I had even produced an album that was selling, you know, thousands of copies and on the local radio station. Mm-hmm. And they didn't see it as enough to let me into their communications major. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, look at all these kids are just shooting, you know, they're just going for, you know, they're just guessing at what they want to do. Right. I'm already doing this in a professional capacity. I'm fucking 18 year old, 19 year old student here. And I'm already doing all this stuff that you're not, even, I'm getting mad now. I'm like, you haven't even fucking produced a record. You haven't even gotten a fucking photo published. Right. And you're telling me I can't get into this major and all I want to do is continue my studies. So I became very disillusioned with the school. Mm-hmm. Um, I kept on going there and I just switched my major. I just went to political science and no, and political philosophy actually is what I ended up in. And mm-hmm. I just said, fuck it. I'm just going to study what I want to study because what I need to study, they don't want to give me. Sure. And, um, it also made me believe that I don't believe if you're a real artist, a real photographer, mm-hmm. it's in your heart, right? It, it, you have the passion because you love it and there's nothing else you can do. Just like musicians, the real musicians, they have to do it. Right. Whether someone's buying it or not, you're going to always make, you can always sit down with your guitar or whatever it is your mu- instrument is and you're going to make your music if, mm-hmm. if that's what you have to do. You know, I mean, I don't take pictures that often anymore, but. I see images, you know, I try and create photographs or I just have them in my head. You know, I don't have to take a photograph, make a photograph every day, every month or even every year necessarily. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that you love, it's you. And um, my point is, is that you can't go to school to learn to become a photographer. You can't go to school to learn to become an artist. Right. Right. What And in fact, even if you are a photographer and you go to school, I mean, the only thing you could learn at school is maybe a way to sell yourself and to make your art commercially viable to other people. Mm-hmm. And if you're OK with that, then that's what you should do. Mm-hmm. You know, I never went to art school. And as we heard from earlier in the interview, even when I took photography one, I got a D. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, because I didn't follow the assignments and. You know, uh, I think that, but I think that art school, it probably, it, it it's probably good to, you know, learn techniques if you haven't learned them on your own already. Sure. Yeah, but that's I really feel say. like, you know, and, and maybe save you some time from working in trial and error because, you know, I shoot a roll of film to this day and you and I both know, and any film photographer knows that. We're never sure until we get the film back. Yeah, how you did. Mm-hmm. You know, I just bought a lens on eBay a couple, last month, and I have to go shoot a roll and see how it came, comes out, mm-hmm. see if the <laughs> see if the glass is in good shape, right. see what's going on, you know, and see how it feels, you know. And, uh, and it, you know, I didn't finish the roll. I waited about two or three weeks. I said, oh, there's this cool thing I want to shoot down in the subway. And so I finished it just, you know, on Friday. And I got it processed. I'll pick it up tomorrow. We'll see how the shit comes out. You know, see <laughs> yeah. how the lens is and see how the thing works. And, uh-huh. You know, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's something that, you know, it runs through your veins, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, skateboarding, skateboarding, punk rock, and hip hop are just run through my veins. But yeah. skateboarding is where I cut my teeth. And if anyone doesn't understand this, you know, the culture of skateboarding, that's okay. Mm-hmm. You don't have to understand it. But, it is something that was very inspirational to me. And, you know, as Ian MacKay said, you know, skateboarding is not a sport mm-hmm. 
to most practitioners. And to him, skateboarding, what it was is it gave him a window on another way of looking at the world. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's do this. Cause I can't, I can't have you on the podcast and not talk about, you know, eighties hip hop. So I just want to back yeah. up a little bit, uh, after, uh, please do after please a couple do. of those rants that I enjoyed. So, <clears throat> but I want to just ask as far as how did, you know, how did the relationship with Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons, how did that even start in the first place? Well, first of all, you have to understand that to me, hip hop was just a natural progression from punk rock. Right. And punk rock was becoming, people were beginning to call it hardcore. Sure. A term, a term that I do not like. Um, I listen to hardcore punk rock. I didn't listen to hardcore music. Right. Although I listen to hardcore hip hop, but it's not hardcore. It's just sure. a really corny name. Um, you know, to me, that genre that calls itself hardcore was, uh, lacking any melody or very little melody and very little music. I just didn't like it. I didn't really care for hardcore. Um, I like, you know, minor threat and black flag and bad brain style punk rock. Mm -hmm. And not to say that I didn't like one or two MDC songs. Um, and you know, Dave Kennedy songs when they were still melodic and, and a lot of great bands out there, but a lot of people, it started to get really sour mm -hmm. around 84. I really was like, this music is whack and and I wasn't really liking much of it after I had produced the Suicidal Tendencies album. Things kind of started to get generic for me and even Black Flag, they didn't go hardcore. They went some other dirge, grunge before there was such a thing, you know, way. And I didn't really even like that. You know, once Dukowski was out of the band, I wasn't really, uh, I thought they had lost their soul mm -hmm. and, um, and not that there weren't some intense performers in the band and, and intense people there were, but I just, the music didn't speak to me like it once did. Right. Um, and at that same time, hip hop started to come up and, you know, even while I was listening to that stuff, even while I was still doing suicidal, I was beginning to listen to, you know, hip hop records were coming up since even the late seventies, but mm -hmm. really the early eighties is when I started to hear more like 81. I got my first hip hop tape. I had a, a, a girlfriend who actually grew up with Adam Yauch who introduced me to, you know, real hip hop and sent me my first cassettes from Brooklyn. And, um, and I was a big fan. Mm -hmm. I got into it right away. Um, you know, I remember playing, you know, Mike Muir, you know, run DMC's first album, you know, in my car while we were driving. And I'm just like, this is the shit. I was loving it, you know? And, He's looking at me like I was crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, other punk people. I mean, I even remember, you know, getting a reaction from some guy who's in a band, listening to some, a New York punk band, calling, leaving a message on my answering machine like, well, what's that jungle music on there, man? Aren't you a punk rocker? <laughs> and I knew how to look at that person a little bit differently after <laughs> yeah, that. That's right. Um, you know, it's kind of scary how weird people could get um, sometimes and how racist people are sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, without knowing it. Um, but I got into hip hop because to me it was, it was a natural progression to punk rock. It was a progressive, radical, interesting, exciting, creative new music. Mm -hmm. um, and then these kids who I had known um, as a punk rock band who I never took seriously as a punk rock band, I didn't care for them. I didn't think they were any good, but I knew the guys, uh, you know, and um, we had a mutual best friend um who had sent me that tape and uh and after i quit suicidal tendencies as their manager um i you know i was in school i was just looking for stuff and i was really getting more and more into hip-hop and i heard that the beastie boys were coming out to los angeles mm -hmm. and i had heard that they had made a real hip-hop record you know on Def Jam, <clears throat> they had these singles, these 12 inch singles came out besides the crazy cookie puss record and they were coming out. And, um, so I told them when they came to, I think they might've even called me. I don't remember what happened, but they didn't know anyone else in California or something like that. And when they came out to LA, we hung out, we had a great time. And 
I took some great photos of them because I was inspired. It was just like new music. And this is my connection to the new music was the Beastie Boys right. because they were a punk rock band and they knew all these guys. And in fact, they were being managed by the same guys that was managing Run DMC. You know, this, uh, this could be an interesting connection, but I hung out with the Beastie Boys. And in fact, Rick Rubin went off the uh the road for a while he was working on they were working on the crush groove movie and russell was not in town and in fact i used russell's uh backstage passes when they were opening for madonna in la <laughs> yeah i think i even and i didn't know russell and rick yet um and we just had a blast when they were in town with the madonna tour and they were just, you know, booed and hated and it was just, you know, it was crazy. But we had a we just goofed on all the celebrities there. I took all these photos then with the celebrities. The goal was really the publicist at the time of uh, of Rush Management at the time had asked me, they said, we really need a picture of the Beastie Boys with Madonna. Could you please get it for us? And uh, <clears throat> and that was the assignment of sorts. And but in the meantime, I was stoked that these guys made a really good rap record. You know, the rock hard record at the time was, at the time was very cool. And so I just wanted to shoot pictures of them. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to shoot great pictures of them because I was inspired by what they were doing. And so we drove around, I took them to, you know, different locations that I thought might be cool. And I just showed them around LA. They had never been to LA. Um, and we took all those goofy pictures with all the celebrities. Because frankly, when we met Madonna, or when I met Donna, they had already known her. They'd been on the road with her, and she just thought they were just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, idiots. She probably regretted taking them on tour because um, she really wanted Run DMC, and then she couldn't get them. Then she tried getting the Fat Boys, couldn't get them. They gave her the Beastie Boys. Right. Um, you know, the Beasties came to town. I got them on Rodney Bigenheimer's radio show. He liked them as a punk rock band. He would not touch their hip hop stuff. And he also liked Madonna. And so they got some major publicity out of that time in LA that they had never had before just because of being on Madonna's tour but we had a great time we took a lot of great photos and Mad oh Madonna didn't want to take the picture with us mm -hmm. with them she wouldn't pose for a photo with them but she was very sensitive at that time about her picture being taken because she was getting really famous sure she wasn't quite that big yet but she was getting very protective of her image and scared and probably you know even when I met her I was surprised at how little she was and um and wasn't as you know uh, how do you say it uh, politely? You know, she didn't look quite as she did in the videos. When you see <laughs> right. <person>. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and, but she says, well, why do you want to take my picture with the, with these guys? And I said, well, we want them to be as famous as you, you know, <laughs> sure. I just fucking with her, you know, just saying, what do you think? I mean, you know, you're on, they're on tour with you, you know? And she says, no, I'm not going to do that. I was like, you know, nothing for me to do. She was the star of the show. And I just, you know, and we went and took pictures with, you know, Rob Lowe and Weird Al Yankovic and Billy Idol, Gene Simmons. Um, and then at the record, we went to her, the party after one of the shows one night, there was a, at another site, there was a venue. She was getting a, a gold record, her first gold record, mm -hmm. you know, um, and she was getting presented her first gold record and Sean Penn was there and David Lee Roth and all those other people there. But we got a picture of David Lee Roth and Sean Penn with the Beastie Boys, and they had no idea who they fucking were. Sure. You know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, we took that, but we were just goofing on all of them. You know, we were just goofing on the celebrities, taking pictures with them, just because we could, and because I had a camera, and it was just fun. And I never liked taking those pictures, but just for the laugh, we mm -hmm. did it, you know. I mean, those guys, if nothing else, would make me laugh as long as I've known them all the time, if nothing else. And uh, so... <clears throat> we had such a good time and I decided, you know, I took him down to a college radio station that I had been on and, uh, you know, before and, and, uh, with suicidal and, and I used some of my punk rock credentials to get them into other places, you know, that I already had. And we shot all these really great photos and Rick and Russell saw them afterwards. And they're like, well, we didn't get the Madonna shop, but we want to use these other photos for publicity and for other things, you know, uh, you know, and they had, I can honestly say they had never seen a photo session worth of photos like I had created for them to see. Right. Um, and, and I, you know, uh, I definitely just, you know, it was overwhelming. I think they were just like, holy fuck. Like they had never seen anything like that. And uh, quite honestly, in hip hop, most of the photography was pretty fucking, you know, 
did not look good. You know? <laughs> yeah, sure. People are being shot in studios, and when they are shot in location, they're you know out of focus. Not, there's nothing there. I mean, there just wasn't any quality photography to speak of at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did really, you know, artistically interesting stuff and stuff like no one had ever seen before in that genre. And they were stoked. And from that point on, actually, every time a band came to LA, they were sent to hang out with me. Uh, a hip hop group. They they were just like, okay, could you help us out? And then all of a sudden, I start becoming like a bit of a West Coast representative for Def Jam and for Rush. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just stopped managing suicidal tendencies and producing them and being their photographer and all that. So I kind of knew what to do, right? Like I, with although I didn't know with hip hop, it was a whole nother business, a whole nother world. Right. But when guys would come to town. I would get them around and, you know, drive them around and show them around and take their photos if I was a fan of what they were doing. And, uh, and you know, those guys loved what I was doing, you know. And I know when, I, uh, when they asked me how much it would cost to use the photos from that session, I think at the time it was an astronomical four hundred dollars which <laughs> them, you know they you know was pretty unbelievable i mean at, at the time really a publicity photo you would get like 50 bucks mm-hmm. you know prop you know an average person back in 85 would get like 50 bucks for a publicity photo and um you know but they had a lot of photos there and that's how i came up with the price i did and and it wasn't unreasonable i've been taking photographs for a lot of years now already and it didn't you know it wasn't nothing i wasn't asking anything astronomical but they're just used to getting shit for free and not paying for any quality and so you know i think that also demanded some respect from them because everything in their world was about money and not in my world i was coming from punk rock world i was just trying to just get what was fair right as i always have and always do um finally they came out with run dmc on the fresh fest tour russell and rick and they had already been seeing my photos. We'd already been talking a lot on the phone. I had helped some of their bands. I'd helped Curtis Blow. I'd helped uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I'd helped, uh, you know, uh, the Beasties maybe another time. And uh, UTFO was an affiliated group, but not with their label. I had shot pictures with. And, and they came out on that tour, I think it was 85. And we finally met in person. And we all just hit it off just like brothers. Yeah. We were just best friends practically from the day we met. We just, you know, Rick was into punk rock. He knew my stuff. He had my My Rules fanzine that I put out in 82. He knew who I was. I didn't know who he was yet. He it wasn't anyone yet. And uh, but, but we all had an admiration and respect for each other um, just because of what Rick was doing with them and what he was doing with Run DMC and what Russell had done with Run DMC. Um, you know, and we just all got along great. We just, you know, the thing that tied us really all together is that um, we all loved music. We just loved it and just lived for it. I mean, every day we were just into the records. We would be in the car listening to loud records and just having a good time. And uh, that's what brought us together. You know? Yeah. Is that when, you know, is that, do you think that kind of marked, a, and I don't want to, because I'm, I'm sure, I don't want to pretend like I know you, but just from talking to you for a little while now and, and you know, what I do know about you, I'm sure you probably shun away from the term career, but is that when it started becoming a little more serious for you as far as like more money coming? Cause that was, you know, even though that was early hip hop, I mean, you were dealing with people that suddenly probably had more money than you were used to in the punk world, you know, that just never, it's, a, it's not, it's very, it's a very accurate, uh, under, um, you know, in skateboarding, I made a little money off of the skate photographs um the um but yeah nothing you know to write home about i mean well actually it was something to write home about it was good i mean as a 16 year old i think i got a check one month for like 1500 dollars. yeah was, huge you know it's a lot of it's a lot of money in 1978 mm-hmm. you know um and i had actually run away from home to take some of those photos that month that i got that check so i mean you know it all worked out really it showed me that i was doing the right thing but once hip hop came along, it was like it was the first thing that I had done that was being commercially recognized around the world immediately. I mean, Skateboarder Magazine was distributed around the world, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like music, you know. Uh, it was still, even though there were a million readers, and then it faded really pretty quickly after that, went down to like, you know, 30,000, you know, uh, very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, you know, in a matter of years. Um, the hip hop thing was a real phenomenon. I mean, like none of the others at the time. Um, they all became bigger later after the fact. Yeah. But when I was involved at the time, yeah, you know. Um, but when you look at the reality of it, yeah, they weren't very big. And so hip hop, yeah, we started talking. Re- it was it was real money. Mm-hmm. And even though I hadn't quite figured out, look at I've been doing my own business since I was fourteen. I've never had a manager to this day. Crazy. <laughs> uh, so I've learned a lot of you know stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I've had to deal with a lot of. Uh, you know, bullshit and people still try and fuck with me to this day. Mm-hmm. You know, you people want to learn about business and how you do it. And, you know, and you people have managers and this and that. I always felt no one could represent myself like I could. Mm-hmm. If I ever met someone who could represent me the way I want myself to be seen, then maybe I'd hire them and give them 10%, maybe even 20. Right. But I've never needed it. You know, the only case I might need it is, you know, if anyone has any contacts out at, uh, you know, at Pentax, since you're out in Colorado, <laughs> I, I would like someone to make me a proper introduction there and let them know who the fuck I am and what the fuck I do. And then maybe they want to do some work with me since I've been supporting and using their equipment over all these years. Absolutely. That, that's about as blatant commercialism as I'll get all but, right. <laughs> for this podcast. But still, I always I still buy my own stuff. I mm-hmm. still get equipment on eBay and stuff like that. But to get back to the point... Um, not having a manager, doing all my own business. I would take cues from other people. I would ask magazine editors what they thought and, you know, and guys who had other experience in the industry. And occasionally I would run into, you know, cool people at the record labels and they would tell me, well, you know, <clears throat> this is what you could charge. Mm-hmm. This is the mo- This is what we have in the budget. And, you know, I did that in my 20s, I said. And then eventually in my 30s, I was like, well, this is what the budget needs to be. Right. I wouldn't just accept what was in the budget. I'd say, well, I need this much. Mm-hmm. I'd say, well, that's not in the budget. I said, well, then, you know, you got to get it in the budget then. Work it out. Make it happen. You know? And years later, I learned even more. You know, I mean, it depends on who you are, you know? Absolutely. I mean, so, you know, but starting to work with major record labels, that's kind of getting to what you're talking about. Sure. Yes. I, I had never worked with major record labels before, other than there's been, it was close, you know, with the Go-Go's and a couple punk bands were getting signed, but never really up there. Hip hop was making money. They mm-hmm. were selling tens of thousands of albums. And yeah, by the time I was, you know, I think, what, I'm trying to think how old I was. I think I was 27 years old. I was able to put a down payment on a, a condo. Mm hmm. You know, and that's what I did. I was making decent money. And uh, but, you know, but again, being frugal like I was, I wasn't whining and dining. I was eating two ninety five soy burger dinners, you know, down to dojos. And, uh, you know, and uh, but I had a nice place. I, and I, that's when I decided that's when I moved from uh, L.A. back to New York permanently mm-hmm. was in 87. And, you know, and, and at the urging of Russell and Rick. Yeah, you should come back. Do you think the way you approached a lot, especially when I look at like some of the early Beastie Boy stuff and the Run DMC, like it seems like you were definitely bringing that skateboard influence with the the real wide angle lenses and like you know really approaching close up shooting from the ground a lot of times. Was that something you were doing consciously? You think, or you think it just kind of worked its way in because that you were well, used to shooting that you know, way? The Beastie Boys were skateboarders, uh-huh. first of all. Okay. At least two of them, you know, um, the fisheye lens when I first met them was something that I was still using. And the thing is, you know, a fisheye lens used properly is good. Used as a gimmick is not good. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I never really, I don't think I ever shot run DMC with a fisheye lens. Right. Maybe a couple of port, you know, maybe once I did. Mm -hmm. Um, I very rarely shot a punk rock band with a fisheye lens. I mean, the salad days photo, yes. Black flag at the party, yes. Mm -hmm. It's because I was in, you know, there was a reason for that. The same reason I used it for skateboarding is to be close, but to also show the environment. I mean, yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at. You look at the cover of Salad Days, right? Of of the of the beat of the the infamous, you know, a minor threat photo on the porch. Mm -hmm. People don't say that's a fisheye. That's not the first thing they see. Sure. They actually, most people, unless you're a photographer, don't even know that it's a fisheye lens that took yeah. that photograph. And that is good. What you, what you could understand, Rick, and I think what speaks to you is that in from the skateboarding days, you see some of that in my 
punk rock and hip hop stuff too. Mm -hmm. What you see there is my devotion to the subject and their own personal character. Sure. And their integrity. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see in the pictures. Doesn't matter what equipment I'm using. Occasionally I will, you know, that, that same fisheye lens that I used to catch Tony Alva in the dog bowl doing the first front side air is the same lens that I used to catch, you know, to, to, to create the image of minor threat on the steps in front of discord house. Mm -hmm. And was that I use quite frankly, when I created yo bummerish the show for public enemies front first album cover, mm -hmm. same lens, 17 millimeter, SMC, a Takamar glass Pentex lens, mm -hmm. you know, an incredibly good lens, but I didn't use it because it was a fisheye. I used it because it's what I saw to best portray that moment. Yeah. That's right? what, I mean, that's what I was kind of getting at was that it seemed like instead of, cause you know, you would see old rock portraits or whatever, you know, and it, people had the tendency to push in. It was all about the artists. And it, I just felt like because you did have a history of skateboarding and in skateboarding, not only is it about the character, it's about the location. You seem to, even when you shot music, the location seemed to really matter to you. And it makes sense when you look at the photo, you're like, Oh, I see what he's trying to do here. You know, like, I feel like it, you're, you're telling as much of, you're trying to tell some of the story of the artist with the location. And, uh, you know, there wasn't entirely, entirely accurate, observation you have made because one of the things i thought was very important particularly to hip-hop was the environment in which it was happening right and one of my biggest rebellious acts towards photography in that art form of hip-hop was to take it out of the studio mm -hmm. most people most photographers would not go into the neighborhood where it was happening or would not go to the venues where it was happening and would shoot people in the studio there's I mean, later on, people did get out there and they did venture and do stuff. But to me, it was all about the environment. Right. It was it was all about the environment and um, and expressing and, and because hip hop was so much about your surrounding. How could you not show what was helping to create these lyrics mm -hmm. in the photographs? You know, to shoot, quite frankly, a hip hop artist in a studio is a travesty. Yeah, I agree. Because the environment in which that art form is so vibrant and so incredible and so culturally significant that to shoot it in a studio, it just makes no sense mm -hmm. at all. Now, I have shot one hip hop artist in the studio at his recommendation, at his, you know, after we had done several album covers already, it was like, you know, you know, or record covers, you know, Ice-T had a particular idea that we needed to do in the studio, okay, we did it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna say I never worked in the studios, but the amount of time that I've worked in a studio in my life, I can count on one hand. Yeah, no, that's great. I know you shoot a lot less these days. Was it, did you start to get burnt out on photography at all, or did you start to get less inspired on what it was you were originally passionate about shooting? I've never been burnt out on photography. I fucking love photography. And every time a camera is in my hands, I feel good. Mm -hmm. But I have not been as inspired in the last 20 years to shoot, right. to make photographs like I was. I am sometimes. And mm -hmm. when I am, I go and do it. And I fucking love it when I'm doing it. I just And, and I need to remember that more often. But honestly, um, I work mostly with my archive. And I'm very proud. And I love my archive. Mm -hmm. And I love the photographs that I created when I was young. And, um, and I, and I enjoy some of the pictures that I created last month, sure. you know, but I, I don't do it as often and I don't see, I mean, there is a need in some ways, but there's less of an appreciation and there's so many people doing things these days, yeah. um, that, you know, certainly, you know, I had another, you know, humbling, great compliment paid to me by one of the artists I shot many years ago. And he said, I said, well, yeah, but there's so many people here shooting. He says, yeah, but that's not you, Glenn. That's not a, you know, they're not going to create a Glennie Friedman photograph. And I was like, right. wow. I couldn't believe that this person said that. And that was really nice. But it's like, but I'm also just not as inspired sometimes to do it. I know I could do it when I want to yeah. most of the time. I could do it and, and, and I hold that in my pocket. But, um, but it's just, 
there's so much going on and um, it doesn't have the impact of what it did. But if I felt that I could do something that it was ex- as, as extraordinary as it was when I was doing it before, uh-huh. I, would, I would certainly be doing it again. When it comes to the youth cultures, though, I mm-hmm. feel as though there should be someone young shooting those young people. Yeah. They should be doing, they should be, you know, there should be someone more passionate than me because they've had to see me as an example. So they should be even more passionate than I was in finding a way to capture what they're doing as powerfully and with as much heart as I did. I think that's a real good segue to one of the other questions that I wanted to ask, which was when you, do you think when we look back 20 years from now and we, or 10 years from now, and we're looking at the nineties and the two thousands, is there anything there that you feel like is going to be, you know, I mean, you live once again, you, you were part of several big transitional periods that really, I feel like impacted history. And so for those young people, you know, that are, that you said should be the ones out there capturing youth culture. Is there anything that you feel like is, is really impactful right now that is going to be a trendsetter or a, a, a shift in history? They should be creating youth culture, right. not just capturing it, creating it. Mm-hmm. If they're the true artists of their era and because of the nature of communications, Mm -hmm. because of the nature of the art form and media nowadays, I don't know if there's, I hope that there's something out there that's going to be as impactful as an, as important for youth today as there was for us back then. Right. But everything now, for the most part, Mm -hmm. I'm generalizing, is so commodified. Mm -hmm. It is so second nature to sell things, to package things, to make them content before they've even become anything. Right. You could have a blog and have more impact than, you know, now than skateboarder magazine did in 1978. You certainly have as many followers if if it's something special. Mm -hmm. Um, But the problem is, is that there's so many different outlets. The intense information is being spread so amongst so many different mediums, right? Right. And it's and it's really getting watered down because people need new stuff every day. Mm-hmm. When I took my first picture for Skateboarder Magazine, it was the only skateboarding magazine there was at that moment. Right. In the world. Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. It was coming out bi-monthly. Right. The photograph wasn't seen until six months after I took it. Yeah. I took the photo in September or October of 1976. Mm-hmm. It was published in a magazine that came out in January mm-hmm. of 77. It was on the newsstands until April of 77. Right. So, you know, and that's why the magazines, I mean, there, and there was no video to speak of. Sure. They had people who would make films, but you could, there was no way to distribute that to anybody. Mm-hmm. Period. Period. You could make a film with a Super 8 camera. No one would see it except for you and your friends and a, if you had a projector. Right. How about right. that? Yeah. In your fucking house. Uh-huh. So that had so much impact then. Mm-hmm. The magazine, that's why the magazine became a Bible. Just like the Bible. It was the only book around. That's why everyone fucking read it and believed that bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Okay? Because there was no other thing. And Skateboarder was very similar. Right. Craig Stesick would write stories, you know, with incredible embellishments and everyone, you know, it was based in some truth, but there was some embellishing and it, you know, made every, the, everyone a legend. Right. You know, um, and, but everyone around the country, as you could see by the documentary, you know, it was, it inspired many, many people. But the reason skateboarders traditionally were this group from California, because you didn't see what was going on. Mm hmm. The epicenter was there for years because there was no other way. People would see the magazine around the world. Six months later, they get inspired by the photographs of what we were doing Mm -hmm. six months before. So they were naturally six months behind. Right. 
until the media started catching up and things came out quicker. And then skateboarder, within a six months, skateboarder became a monthly. Mm-hmm. But even then, a fucking monthly. We're looking at the barracks and all these websites. There's shit on every fucking hour. Yeah. You know what I mean? New shit every hour. Shit yeah. just happened yesterday. I put it on. I took a picture of Tony Alva yesterday. It is we're certainly not on the cutting edge of anything, right? Other than you know, but yeah, it's forgotten. Two, two hours later, I got it on Instagram. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm just saying, you know. So you know, things used to you you used to sit at home and read a magazine and marinate in this shit for a fucking month before the next magazine it had a profound influence on the youth lifestyle Mm -hmm. so did records we would listen to a record because a new record wouldn't come out that often right and when it did when it was a good one the good ones were far and few between every record that came out wasn't great every band that i saw wasn't great most bands sucked i took pictures of the bands that i liked Mm mm-hmm some bands I wanted to take pictures of, I never got a chance to take pictures of, too, you know? Yeah. But most of what I wanted to do, I did. Not everything. Not in skateboarding. Mm-hmm. <coughs> not in punk rock and not even in hip-hop. Yeah. But, hey, look, it goes to... It only goes to validate your taste that if you were only shooting the things that you really liked and thought were good, you you know, you got good taste. <laughs> it worked out. You were right. <laughs> you know, stood the test of time in the long run. And it's nuts, you know, because like you said, it's not, you know, if you looked at your body of work and thought, well, like you just said, there was tons of other stuff going on. Just, you just happened to be picking the ones that ended up, you know, not, maybe not all of them, but man, a lot of it ended up becoming legendary, you know, not just, not just well known, but like extremely well known, you know. So yeah, uh, la- some people. I mean, someone might go as far to say too, not to sound too egomaniacal, but sometimes that imagery might have helped. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Those things, of course, those it did. Achieve that status. Of course, it did. Because for kids like me, growing up in some small town in Kentucky, that's all we had. You know, I mean, like that, and it, and like you were saying, you know, it it came out three months, six months later, it took two years before it trickled down to me, you know, and then, and then we were getting a hold of it. Like, Oh my God, look. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last question. I, I like to end the show usually by saying, what advice do you give to young people coming up? But I I think for you, I just want to, I want to say it like this because we do it. We've got a lot of young listeners. We've got a lot of veterans that listen to the show too. We've got a lot of, and I also think we touched upon that a little bit. We did earlier. We did for sure. And so Mm -hmm. I think for you, I'd like to end it by just saying, do you have closing statements towards our younger listeners, you know, and take it from there? I think that um, if it's in your heart, You'll find a way to do it. As soon as you have to depend on it for a way to live, it gets polluted Mm -hmm. um, and it's not as pure. Um, If you could separate what you love from what you have to do to survive, um, to make a living, if it's not what you're loving, then do that. Mm -hmm. Separate them. Try not to make the mix too much um, because you don't want to, you know, uh, water down what's in your heart because your true heart of hearts, your true passion, I think if you are a true artist, will show up in the work. Mm -hmm. And when it's lacking, it will be absent from the work. Um, If you are just a photographer um, who is just there to take pictures, not create pictures, but just to take them, Mm -hmm. and to take advice from art directors and editors and stuff like that to, to, and, and don't have enough, you know, and don't really care about that, then that, then that's fine too. That's what you do. You're a cog in the wheel that's necessary for it to run. Mm-hmm. Um, my advice is more for the leaders, mm-hmm. you know, and I want there to be more leaders. I think there needs to be more leaders, not enough people. If I want to inspire anything, it's for people to stand the fuck up and say what they think after they educate themselves. And I think more people need to speak up. I want more people to speak up. I want more people to be loud. Not to be obnoxious, but to fucking fix this world that we are in. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great things in this world. America was already great. America could be greater. But what we see as great and what other people see as great are in two different fields. I want to see more leaders I want to see people taking a stance for things that they believe in and 
especially those, particularly those things that are good for the planet, for everybody, you know? That's great. I think that's great, Glenn. I think it's a good place to leave it. You know, uh, thank you. Thank you very okay. much. It's, it's been a pleasure. I, 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 I tend to leave people as much time as they want to do an interview. As long as it's interesting, I will continue to talk as long as I can. I've done interviews where I've had to cut people off in 10 minutes, quite honestly. Well, then I hope that means I did okay. Revolution. Revolution.